for this particular workshop, we'll be working to develop a workflow to basically help document your models, how you could specifically work it for your um, portfolio. So I guess we start with kind of some award-winning portfolios from the last year. So these are just images taken from the Instagram for GSAP where uh, these past students had um, developed their model uh, portfolios. And these are some of them with uh, their models next to their f drawing. So you can see that they are pretty well taken photos, but a lot of times they'll be um, next to these really nice drawings. So if you spend a lot of time drawing and you spend a lot of time doing your models, you might as well just photograph them a little better. Um, because the school recently has been pushing for a lot more models, so it would be good for you to start developing a really quick workflow to photograph all your models and not only just to archive them, but start thinking about how you can use photographs of your models to highlight certain parts of your project. Um, and also, uh, models don't really exist if you don't take pictures of them and put them in your portfolios because they start falling apart or you just throw them out or you lose them at some point. So I, that's why uh, I think this is the first time we're doing a model photography workshop. And also in, um, after GSAP, this is also pretty helpful for you to have nice images of your models when you're applying to jobs. And I found that working at a firm, it's actually a really helpful skill to have to be able to photograph models really well. Um, so we'll start with some examples. And this is uh, the most, like a recent competition that OMA won where they're taking a building and like breaking into quadrants and highlighting it that, uh, reno uh, that in the renovation. So here they kind of show in the model that they're splitting it up into four and a before and after shot of what, their mo uh, what the renovation would do. So it just, it's like a nice kind of way to use your models in a photo, re uh, photo representation of a specific aspect of your project and not just for archiving. This is a model by Moss Architects. Uh, rather than doing a nighttime rendering on the computer, they actually lit their models up and give you a more realistic idea of what it would be like if they were to light up their model at night or what the space would be like. Um, Rural Urban Framework just spoke earlier this week and they said that in their lecture that this model helped them kind of develop how they would construct the building in the end and they use this to actually um, give to their uh, the the construction team, and I think they ended up using another one because the construction team was like, this is too complicated, we can't do this. So uh, this is a nice way to kind of show the buildup of a project. Um, this is an installation by Howler and Yoon. They spoke last year, and this image shows a lot of movement, uh, kind of taking advantage of how a camera works to show in a still image how it can be used by the public. Uh, this is a model done by a student in second year and how she basically uh, was able to show what her model would do in real life as a moving kinetic model but in an image that could be hard to translate so what she did was actually like spun it and this way she actually could see the kind of uh, the point of the model and um, later in the lecture uh, I'll go over you know, just, just quick points of how to achieve these models after we uh, these images after a little bit more setup um, but I also wanted to highlight the fact that everything we're going to talk about today in terms of how we're going to develop a workflow to uh, best take photos of your models is that all the equipment is available at the AV office. They recently got new cameras. You just have to be able to remember to reserve the cameras the day be a business day before, before 7.30 p.m. And then they'll send you a confirmation email whether or not you can take it out. So what they have, they're like basic tripods. They recently got new DSLR cameras, the specifically the T, or Canon T5i with an 18 to 55 millimeter lens so you can kind of zoom in and out. Um, and lighting equipment, so they also got new lighting equipment but I think right now they're on back order. But everything you need for just taking pretty good uh, images are available at the AV office. They have nine tripods, 10 DSLR cameras, and the lighting equipment will come later. And for this specific uh, workshop, we'll be using the Canon T5i in all our images. So we'll start by um, pretty basic setup of lighting, a tripod, and backdrop. And it seems pretty obvious, but a lot of people don't take that seriously. And then their images come out a little like blurry, and they don't 
that aren't very consistent. So it's really important to able to set up your kind of scene very well. And it also sets up your shooting a lot better. So we're going to talk about photography in the second part of this uh, workshop and how the photography and how you shoot it based on the setup would actually make your editing a lot easier. And I know from uh, talking to other students in this school and basically any architecture school, when you obsessively take images of your model, you have like hundreds of one model and it gets really confusing, it gets really frustrating to edit them all at once. So in the editing portion of this, we'll be doing a demonstration of how to basically edit within camera within Adobe Bridge with Camera Raw and then processing it, processing it out later in Photoshop. So it makes it a lot easier to be able to edit all your images at once rather than edit each single one in Photoshop, which can take a lot of time. Yeah? So, um, I used to use Lightroom, but I think for the purposes of this like workshop and this workflow, I find that Adobe Bridge is much faster because you're able to navigate through your computer based on where your photos are already placed rather than importing a new file. And then um, I find this is actually much faster for batch editing rather than just like going to each one and toggle it differently than like copying that and pasting it. Um, but for this practice, I found that it's easier. So we'll start with setup. And um, I think, so we'll start with like food photography. I think it's a very good example of how important a scene is. And you can see on the computer screen, like what is basically being taken just by where the tripod's placed, the natural lighting next, by, uh, next to the scene with the window, and um, where the food is placed, and the composition of the image. So how you set up your scene it seems really basic, but at the same time, it makes the rest of your job a lot easier. Um, so we'll first start by talking about lighting with natural lighting. And in terms of model photography, a natural lighting is great because it's, really, it's more realistic, it's beautiful, but the problem with that is it depends on the time and the weather outside, and it requires a very specific context. And if you're going to be shooting your model for, at for maybe even an hour, the lighting based on the sun could change because the sun doesn't care how long it takes for you to photograph your model. It's going to move, and then things start changing. Um, and another one is artificial lighting. So it, I prefer artificial lighting than to natural lighting, depending on, well, most for most models. But it gives you more control and a lot more flexibility. So I think three steps uh, I wanted to highlight were just to turn off your overhead lighting if you're using Avery 506, just remember to turn that light above off so it doesn't start uh, casting weird shadows. You would need a fill light, and the fill light is this one here, where it's kind of indirectly pointing and creating a uh, lighting atmosphere for your model without casting too many direct shadows. Um, it says umbrella there, and I'm pretty sure the AV office has lights with umbrellas, so you just gotta remember to like point the light at the umbrella, and it'll create like a more diffused environment to just like light the atmosphere. And then a main light that points at your model to create uh, more realistic shadows, um, but that's really up to you. But just um, never use more than one main light because it starts casting multiple shadows and that just not, that doesn't look realistic and it just starts looking really weird. Uh, today we're gonna focus on artificial lighting. Um, so this is just a couple images that I found online of um, light model study or with a light study with models with artificial lighting kind of to highlight, um, kind of reiterate that you can start using photographs of your models to also highlight aspects of your project, not just to archive your models, just to have them. Um, the next part of the setup, I want to talk about tripods, which are very, very important. I think a lot of people take these for granted, and um, you should always have a tripod when you're shooting your model. It gives you more consistent images, so if you're going to have a lot of the same, a lot of different angles of your model, uh, model they're going to look at, um, at least more or less from the same view if you're doing like elevations or planned uh, photos. Uh, it stabilizes your camera so that way your images are much sharper and you'll always be sharper with a tripod than with your hands, especially with these like bulky DSLRs. Um, better for shooting macro, so when you get up really close, that's what, uh, when, you're taking, uh, when you're shooting a macro, you get up really close and you take small details of a model or an object. And um, the flexibility to move around, so once you have it set up, you can use your hands to move around the model or kind of just move around the room in general to like uh, adjust lighting without the angles changing too much. And it's easier to use live view. So with the new cameras that the AV office has, the screen uh, is, can, can, uh, if you press a button, it actually turns on a live screen mode. So you're able to see what's going on with the adjustments um, as you would looking through a viewfinder. So I'll uh, talk about it at the end. 
how to do that. And this is just an example of some photos I took over the summer when I was working uh, at SOM, where we uh, did a bunch of iterations and then had to photograph all of them. And this is what kind of resulted from that, trying to get uh, a lot of the models taken at the same angle and just like a good compilation of like a ton of iterations. And I'm sure everyone here has, pushed, um, has done a lot of iterations of a building and this would be a nice way to kind of consistently photograph them and document them. And a backdrop, um, I find that a backdrop usually when you're photographing a model on its own is really great. It minimizes the editing and post-processing time, which just means when you're editing something later, you want to delete everything in the background. You just go into Photoshop and you highlight everything that's like white within a certain tone range. And then that just deletes it really quickly rather than um, like going around every corner trying to select like where that coffee mug you left in the photo by accident. And it just like cuts down, down, uh, editing time really by a lot. The images are much cleaner. There's a lot more consistency, especially if you're using the same backdrop. And um, just a suggestion, light models should be on a dark background and vice versa, just so it's, it pops a lot easier, but it's just really up to you. Um, in the second part of this, we're gonna jump into f shooting. So just, like actually using the camera and we're gonna focus on manual shooting. And the way you set up your, what we just talked about would set up your um, man manual shooting a lot better. It would make it a lot easier for you to shoot. Um, and one of the advantages of shooting in manual is that you have all the same or at least very similar settings. So later when you edit, it's a lot easier to edit all of them at once. And you have a lot more control, so you're able to kind of adjust it based on what you want. So this is just a pumpkin in my apartment that I took a photo of. Um, still there, it's from Halloween. But uh, basically, the one on the left in automatic mode was what the camera adjusted for me and said that that was the best option where it adjusted the light, the white balance, and all those little things. And the one on the right was I switched it to manual mode and then um, this has absolutely no editing on it and the walls are actually white, what they actually are, and the pumpkin looks more realistic. Um, it looks less dark and creepy. Um, so in manual mode with the Canon T5i, what, you just basically turn the dial on the top where the M is, and then you can start uh, controlling the five aspects on the side, which we're going to talk about today. Because I um, personally, I find those the most important basics when you're taking photos of your model, just to like streamline it really quickly. The first one we're going to talk about is uh, image quality, and I always start with making sure that all my images are taken in either, J um, you only have two options, but taken in RAW. And in JPEG, you have these more, what it's when you're, I mean, everyone knows what a JPEG is, but it, in a camera, it, what it does is that it takes the photo from the sensor and then it compresses everything and kind of fixes, fixes like these things and then it compresses it. So we have, you get a relatively small file and it's great for when you're looking to take photos and then just immediately print it or use it online or something. Um, so it's great for really fast ones, but for the purposes of like a more professional portfolio, either for academic purposes or for applying to jobs, I find that using raw images are great because you get exactly what the sensor sees and you have all your options when you're editing. So the lighting can be controlled a lot better. And so it was like the, uh, the light temperature so today we're actually going to specifically shoot in raw photos or raw images. So we have everything that's uncompressed, unprocessed. Um, but also a warning that these files are huge. So JPEGs, at least large JPEGs, if you shoot it on DSLR around like five megabytes and a raw file is about like 35 almost. So it can fill up your hard drive really quickly. So just make sure you have space either on an external one or you're like loading it onto the Google Drive. And uh, with the cameras uh, here, you just, uh, I wanted to go through the steps of how you would actually set this up just to make sure that people aren't getting lost um, when actually doing it themselves. But uh, so you just press the menu button and then you select image quality, which is the very first thing. And then in here, you just scroll around until uh, you get to raw, which is right here. And then like large, medium, small, and those are all JPEG formats and raw is its own. Um, the next thing is white balance, which when shooting models I think is important, especially if you're just using fluorescent lighting, it can come off kind of weird if you're using it in auto. But basically uh, white balance in a camera setting is removing unrealistic color casts. And this little chart I found online um, highlights the 
color temperatures and uh, measures them in Kelvin and kind of gives you a relative light source of what it would be. So 1,000 would be candle flame, and then you can read the rest. But basically, um, light has its own temperature or relative temperatures. So when you're shooting, you can actually adjust the white balance. So that way, all your images come out with one overall light cast. So if you're editing later, you can edit them all at once to the same white balance or the camera adjusts it for you. I actually find the cameras are pretty good if you're setting it yourself. Um, and also on auto, they're not too bad either. But so here's an example of the relative light warmth. And the middle one is the white balance one, so it looks the most realistic. And the one on the right looks like the bird's on fire. And then the one on the left is just like a more cool tint. It's like a little bit, it's got like a purpley blue tint if you, I don't know if it's showing up on the projector. But um, we feel like when you're shooting models, you want to aim for like white models, want to look white rather than kind of orangey. Well, he looks compressed. But this is Renzo Piano when he spoke here a year ago. And so Wood Auditorium is actually about 3,000 Kelvin. So whenever I shoot events here, we, I actually set my camera to 3,000. So this is kind of the difference on the left where it's a little warmer. On the right is kind of the adjusted white balance. So it looks more realistic because these walls aren't normally orange. It's just the kind of the light cast on them from those things. But uh, yeah. So how to adjust that is pretty easy on the camera. There's a WB button, and you just press that, and then you just select for which one you want and based, based on their scene. So I think the ones from the AV office are going to be LED lights. So white, white fluorescent light should be pretty good at kind of giving a very neutral tone to your photo and, um, when you're shooting. Or you can go over to like custom right here, and you can set it yourself and find what works best for you based on, I mean, every, every situation is a little different. And there's the auto one right here, which is the default. And it's actually not that bad. I find that auto is actually pretty good. Um, and I, th wood, I think for white balance, it gets pretty important when you're shooting wood models. Because wood models, I find, are, I mean, they give off a warmer feel. So it kind of starts messing with the, uh, the environment when you're shooting. And your images come out a little too warm. So. White balance would be a really good way for your models when they're made of wood to come out a little bit more realistic and a little less in, like, in your face. Um, so now we're gonna talk about aperture. So aperture uh, is this hole formed by those uh, the eight sets uh, eight blades when in your lens. So you can see here the like different sizes. The size of the hole or the aperture is measured in f-stops, and it controls brightness and depth of field. But uh, so this f-stop, f-stop 22, you can, uh, it's a really high number, so you get a really small hole. And the f-stop 1.8, really big hole, just different uh, extremes. But basically, how big it is controls how much light gets into the camera. And it also indirectly affects your depth of field. So the, um, I took a couple photos of this camera with the exact same settings in manual, but the only thing I changed was the aperture. And the first one, it's a really dark image where the f-stop is 7.1, so it just means that the hole's really small, so the less light gets in, the image comes out much darker. And on the right, I compensated by just ch uh, changing the f-stop to a much lower one, so the aperture gets much wider, so the image becomes brighter. But um, a secondary effect of uh, the size of the hole is actually your depth of field. And uh, kind of, it just starts I don't really know how to explain it exactly, but uh, it starts prioritizing certain things, what you're, uh, you're focusing on, and everything else starts getting more and more blurry. So it gives you a really good effect if you want to focus on one thing by blurring everything else out. Um, it, uh, it works with the light. So um, when I took these photos, I had to compensate by changing the shutter speed to kind of make them both around the same brightness. But with a higher f-stop, you have a smaller hole, so you, have, you get a lot more detail in with things kind of behind and in front of what you're focusing on. So here we're focusing on the art of an equality book. And then in the background, it's a lot more detailed than the one on the right where your aperture is much wider because your f is much lower. So you're, um, you have a greater depth of field. Um, so things get more, and yeah, things get more blurred out. Um, and I th for high, for things like sight models, I think it's good for you to use thing, uh, a higher aperture with, um, you get way more detail in, so you're not blurring out a lot of your model. It starts flattening your image. Um, so 
that's where um, aperture can become important when you're shooting in manual for specific types of models. And then for a lower aperture, you can start focusing on, on, um, on certain scenes that you want to highlight so everything else gets a little more, more blurry. So you can kind of guide where the reader is, or what the person is looking at. So here it's a pretty low aperture, so things in the background that aren't focused on are getting really blurry and out of focus, so you can just like stare at this little guy here. Um, yeah, so how you set it up on the camera, you just press that Q button and you start, and you can navigate to the aperture option and you click that and then you can just scroll with the front wheel on the camera to get what, to get the specific aperture you want. That one's a little bit more confusing than the others. The others are more straightforward, I think. In manual, aperture is a little bit more difficult to set. Um, for shutter speed, um, it was, it starts also playing with light, but it also controls how blurry things are, and I think it's important to go through basically the guts of a DSLR. So we talked about aperture earlier and how big the hole is and how much light you get in. So the path of light enters here and it bounces off the mirror, and then you can see this fun arrow situation. And this is the viewfinder where you look through, you can see what's going on, it's because of this mirror. So you take an image, when you actually take an image, the mirror moves down and then the shutter rolls <laughs> forward and how long it opens up for the light to actually hit the sensor is your shutter speed time. So the longer you set your shutter speed, which is usually measured in fractions of a second, um, the more light, or the longer, not more light, the longer light would actually hit your sensor. The amount of light that hits your sensor is based on your aperture and how long it hits your sensor is based on your shutter speed. So the longer you set your shutter speed, the more your camera is like recording the image so that's how you can start playing with how bright your images are with shutter speed and how much blur you want. But if you're shooting on a tripod, um, for most of it, unless you are setting it for like 10 seconds, um, if you're shooting on a tripod, most of your image sh images should come out pretty sharp and there shouldn't be any blur. But when you're holding it, I think anything less than, anything slower than like a 1 50th of a second, you start seeing a lot of motion blur. So this is a can of oatmeal. Um, the only thing I changed here was the shutter speed. The one on the left is 1 50th of a second and the other one is 1 20th of a second, which isn't much of a difference, but you can see that it really affects how much light um, uh, is there in the photo. And then uh, it's also pretty easy to s control shutter speed on the DSLR in manual. You just kind of play with that wheel in the front and it'll change it on the increments that are set by Canon. Uh, and the last thing we'll talk about in terms of manual shooting is ISO. Uh, originally it's from film cameras and how film was set to the sensitivity to light. So it used like a low ISO film, like ISO 100, for really bright situations that you're shooting outside during the day. And then ISO up to like 800 or here it's like 6400. You would use it in situations where it's a lot darker, like wood a lot of times is pretty dark, so you'd use a higher ISO for this room. So that can, and DSLRs, it's a software now, it's not just film, so it's great that you can just change it on your camera rather than like switching film in and out. Um, but the thing is, with ISO, the higher you set it, even though you get to more light, you get a lot more noise. So you, it's, it's, uh, it gets really grainy, which is, I think, some people like that now. It's like a thing you can add to your images to make it look so like vintage. But I think for your art, uh, for your portfolios, you want more, or I don't know what you want, but I think images, they should start off with something very clean and with very low noise so you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and this is an image I took of a coffee I made. Uh, here, the only thing I changed was the ISO. So the higher the ISO, the brighter the image, the lower it is, the darker, so just less sensitive to light. And then, I don't know if you can see on the screen, but um, I changed the ISO from 100 and the other one to 6400, but I adjusted the shutter speed just to compensate for the amount of light. But the higher your ISO, the lot grainier and the poorer the quality of the image is. Um, and for the Canon T5i, you just press the ISO button and then you select on the screen which one you want. Um, and then this is the live view button. So when you press this button with the little red dot and the camera with the screen on it. 
uh, icon, you can basically see exactly what your image will turn out like rather than kind of guessing every time looking through the viewfinder. Uh, and this way, I usually do this, is you can just adjust the, all those things we just talked about as you can see it change. So you can just get your image right away so you don't have to guess every single time. It makes it a lot easier. And, and just to like kind of reiterate those three last points of uh, in manual shooting, where the aperture, ISO, and shutter speed all affect brightness, but they all have their like secondary effects with depth of field, noise, and motion blur, um, and how they kind of play with each other and to get a more, uh, get a like a very desired image. Um, when I'm setting up my camera, I usually start with ISO where I would set it to a very low ISO so your images are not as noisy and there isn't a lot of grain everywhere. You can add the grain later if you really want to. Um, so a really low ISO gives you a cleaner image, but it has a lower sensitiv sensitivity to light. Um, so, and then I set my aperture based on, what the uh, based on what the model or the object is. So if, it's a really, if I want a lot of detail, I set a really high aperture. If it's a small model and I want to focus on like, a little detail and blur everything else out, I set a really low aperture. Um, but based on those, I then choose my shutter speed. So if I choose, so we're going to go with photographing a sight model. If I'm shooting a sight model, I shoot with a really high f-stop. So my image is going to be really dark, but I get a lot of images in. So I'm going to set a s really slow shutter speed so the image gets a lot more light hitting the sensor. Well, um, so that way they play off each other and you get a much more normalized image. And um, so in this scenario, shutter speed is actually the only one that's really controlling the amount of light in the very end because the other two were actually taking advantage of their um, secondary uh, functions so I saw you want a low no I want low noise you wanted uh, we wanted a low depth of field so it's really so it's a lot of detail so in shutter speed that's when you can compensate for the amount of brightness and here's just uh, some kind of archived images that w I always take and when we were shooting for Barnard models to archive their models we would always take all these very specific um, like architectural views so like an axon perspective where you get it from every view. Even if you don't feel like you'll use these views, you'll be able to have these when you need it later, if you ever need it, but your models are gonna be destroyed at some point, so uh, you should just obsessively take all those images and in an elevation, you can start spinning it around. And with these, we just use like a tripod, everything we talked about, um, same lighting for all of it, so editing was a lot easier. And just to go back to these, can, I'm assuming that this one and this one were shot, uh, shot around the same scene, where this one there was definitely like a tripod being used and the lighting doesn't really change except the objects in the background do, but that way you get very consistent images that can read as one. And then with this one, we talked earlier about how the aperture, shutter speed, and the ISO control light, so probably what they did here when they shot the model was that they set a pretty low aperture because you get a lot of detail in the background too. But you, they set a pretty slow shutter speed and it looks pretty clean, but they could, you could edit out noise too, but it's not the best way to do it. So I'm assuming here they had a pretty low shutter speed to get a lot of light in, but a, um, a pretty high f-stop to get all the details of the model in. Um, this was probably taken all as individual scenes, so this Everything in this row was probably taken with the camera just pointing down at it in plan with a tripod. And then the ones down here was with the tripod kind of pointing it at an angle rather than pointing straight down. And these were all taken probably separately and then photoshopped together as like, as if they were all next to each other. Cause um, yeah, uh, here uh, with the motion blur, we, they probably use a sh slow shutter, shutter speed. So it's recording more and you can see more movement and. Um, and here what Kimmy did was that she set a slow shutter speed so things seem like they're moving and you can see the people are actually, they actually look like they're moving. I think the plan of this, I mean the purpose of this model was to kind of see how people moved in the building and she put uh, different scenes throughout the building and then you can only see it happen if you spun it like if it was like flipping through an animation book. So, so she set a slower shutter speed and compensated with aperture. 
So it would give her this like moving effect of that the people are, are actually alive. Then, so basically everything that you do in setup in setting up your scene and how you shoot your model in manual makes editing a lot easier, especially when you're shooting from very consistent views. So the crops can be really straightforward and the lights um, don't really change. Your settings are all the same. So we're gonna go into Bridge now. So the thing about, so when you open up Bridge, it's basically just, it was, it was always been a, it's been a management tool within uh, the Adobe Suite and it's always been mandatory until Creative Cloud. So if anyone's using Creative Cloud, you have to optionally, you have the option to download it. So you, if you don't have it and you want to use it, you actually have to go out of your way to get it. But everyone else on, if uh, anything earlier than Creative Cloud should have Adobe Bridge already part of their program. It comes with Photoshop usually. Um, and it's available on all computers in this building. So it's usually used as a management tool um, and it allows for organizing and editing groups of files all at once. Uh, so I usually when I open it, it defaults to just be on your desktop and then you can find where you put your file and it directly edits them. So here we put it all into a demo folder and these are the two I put, one with a white background and one with a black background. And what, uh, what Adobe Bridge does is that it edits raw files through Camera Raw because Photoshop actually can't read Camera Raw. So, I mean, uh, can't read raw files. So it actually opens up another type of program that lets you edit it first and then you import it in. But here we're just gonna use um, Camera Raw as it is, as a program itself. So you right click and you say open, what, that's not there. Oh, here it is. You right click and it go to open in Camera Raw and it pops up this little window. Um, so the first, things I, first thing I usually do is I highlight everything on the side at once that I want to edit. And then I go to the profile here, the lens correction, and then I check this box, and it, it automatically corrects it to what, it kind of like compensates for the distortion that you get when you use lenses that are made of glass. But, um, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that. It just corrects the lens distortion. Then I go to details and I make sure that there's a little bit sharper than usual and you can like kind of edit out noise here. And I usually just do that just a little bit just to kind of make up for any kind of noise in the background that I didn't want to deal with while shooting. But if we're going to edit a black, um, black background one, I usually just turn up the exposure a little bit to see that, to see the white a little better. And if I want to see the wood, I would turn up the vibrance and the con uh, saturation a little bit more. And then when you turn this up, you can kind of start seeing this like black cloth in the background. And I think a lot of people use the backdrops upstairs and they're kind of, they're pretty dirty. So unless you want to get rid of all of them, you go to usually go into Photoshop and you edit them out by hand. But I found that one trick is that, I'm gonna turn it up a lot just to show it, but um, there's like a black toggle here. You just turn down the black toggle and it kind of like disappears. Eh. And I just turn down the highlights, so because what a lot of people do by accident is they like wash it out, so you can't tell where edges are. So I usually turn down the highlights a little bit, and based on what you want for your shadows, if you want to make a really dramatic effect, you turn that down. But I don't usually edit too much because I personally don't like images that are too edited looking. But basically, this is what we ended up with, and then. With a white background one, you can see a kind of a green tint. So that was the white balance that the camera kind of picked up, but because it's in raw, it gives you everything and you can kind of edit it that way. I usually just turn down the temperature a little bit and I play with the tint. So I turn it, pull it to the purple and it moves back. There's also an easier way where you can just like click this eye drop and you click on somewhere that seems really white and it kind of gives you a more balanced image. But if I want the background to be really white, I play with the temperature and the tint a little bit. These two work together to give you a more neutral white. And then I turn up the white a little bit and then turn down the black. But just this is just like a preference, but you guys can do whatever you want. And then you can kind of see the shadow back here, but I just play with these little toggles. Um, and I mentioned earlier that like wood kind of gives you a really weird color and it's really warm in images. So I usually just turn down the satur saturation a little bit for like brown materials like wood and chipboard so it doesn't read really heavy. So I guess these are pretty much done. And then I press done and it applies the, and you see this little thingy here? It just means that it's been edited. And if we go to where we stored it, 
uh, it created this temporary file. So it just means that you're actually editing your images without actually directly editing them. So this is a really non-destructive way of editing your images. So you're not, not constantly saving them out and then you can't go backwards. But what it does is it creates a really small XMP file. It just kind of sits there and it has the edits. And when you open up Bridge, it reads those and assigns it back to the actual one. So this way you're leaving your raw images kind of untouched, but at the same time you have the uh, option to go backwards if you want. So what I do is usually copy the setting and then I just apply it to all of them. Then right click again, develop settings, paste settings. And then usually I just select, you select whatever you think is, should be applied to the other ones. And then that way you're editing them all, all at once. So if I open them in camera raw again, they all have the, exactly the same kind of setting on them. And because we shot them with a tripod and with the same lighting, you can kind of make a GIF situation. Isn't that fun? But um, yeah, so look at that. <laughs> So if, I don't know, I mean, there's a lot more digital presentations now, I think, here at GSAP than in the past, so I think this would be a great way for you to get your ideas across. And same thing with this one. You just copy the settings, and you select everything, and you paste it, and then, okay. Now they all have the same settings again, so. Ah, I'm pressing caps lock. So you open in camera raw, you can just double check it yourself. And you can also go into in, um, images in, uh, specifically and edit little bits if you want. So we just did that. And that was how we kind of got a lot of our images edited and taken at once. And then if you want to see what it looked like before, I just like uncheck this preview box. It wasn't that different. But <laughs> yeah, that's what it looked like. Whatever. <laughs> well, they look the same. <laughs> But um, so afterwards, you have all these temporary files kind of created kind of to match those. And they're all still raw files. And what you can do now is that uh, you just highlight all of them. You go to Tools. You go to Photoshop. And then Image Processor. I think oh, this is a lot, so we're just going to take two. Ah. Yeah. Tools, Photoshop, Image Processor. And what it does is it actually Cre uh, takes those temporary edit files that we made earlier and it applies them directly. And you can save it as a JPEG, but we're going to save it now as a TIFF. And save in same location. So it takes those raw files, which you can't really read in a lot of programs, and directly, and directly changes them or translates them into either a JPEG, PSD file, or a TIFF file. And you press run and make sure that it's in same, save same location. Um, so it will like, process them through right now, hopefully. It's slow, but it will take them and then spit it out into a folder. So, oops. so you see here, it says TIFF. It made that folder, and then here are your images. These are your edited images. So, open with. So now it's no longer a giant raw file. It's actually a smaller. You can do this JPEGs too, but we did TIFFs here. Um, I don't know if this is important for a lot of people, but I find it really helpful when I can batch rename everything in Bridge as well. So this way you are organizing your files a little better instead of having them with like NF6A8. I don't even know what that is. But um, you can just like say project and then, I don't know, you can just do that and then always have sequence number rename them all so they're all under the same project name and they're all in kind of it'll be easier to organize but yeah that's it do you have any questions no? we'll answer that <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i think um when you're working with your files um JPEG is a way, the reason that you would use a JPEG is that you would want to compress the file size down so that you could send it or email it um, or it could be transferred. Um, what JPEG, JPEG compression does is it triangulates your image. So basically, when you're dialing in the image quality, you're telling it basically how much it's going to be fragmented. So what it does is it basically like breaks up your image into a jillion triangles. 
And then it assigns colors to those triangles based on the proximity of the actual pixels. Um, so it's a compression engine. Um, if you've ever seen a JPEG that has like a little bit of noise around it, like sometimes you'll have a black and a white that are really close, and you'll notice that like in that boundary there are like little specks of black. That's because it's been saved over a number of times. And so when you keep compressing it over and over again, it triangulates it over and over again and begins to create that noise. So as a general rule of thumb, you should always work in Photoshop or Illustrator. Um, another option to, is to work as a TIFF file. Make sure if you work as a TIFF, you save it in layers. The TIFF file does not compress your image. It keeps it in its original state. Um, and then every time you need to produce a file, like if you needed to send email an image of your work, then you would save out a JPEG from Photoshop. But you should never save out a JPEG from Photoshop and then reopen that JPEG again in Photoshop and work on it and save it again as a JPEG. You're just destroying your file. So always use Photoshop, um, Illustrator, or TIFF for editing. Like always keep that as a live file. And then as you're working in, um, in sort of like it's the final step, um, then you can save it out as a JPEG. Does that make sense? And it's also important when you're using your camera settings um, because you will, if you start with a J, if you take an image from a camera and you start as a JPEG, the camera stores it as a JPEG, you can open it in Photoshop, but don't resave it as a JPEG. Keep it open in Photoshop. Yeah. Or have it shoot it raw or tip. Yeah. So like how we did it here was we set the camera in the very beginning to sh only shoot raw images and it's the same situation where you're having all the original data and that's why it's such a big file. Um, and the camera is not compressing it for you and do doing all its processing so you're not getting a JPEG directly out of the camera. You're getting the all the raw data. Data, data. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Yeah. I've never done that personally, but um I mean it's part of portfolio, right? It's yeah. never gonna be that It's not. That's why um but it's I think it's not the size, like dimensions of the image that the raw file is like, good for. I think what the raw file is good for is like the pixel information, so like how bright a pixel, pixel is. So when you're editing, it's a lot easier. And it gives you everything rather than it uh, compresses all the information, so it makes editing a lot harder. Or That's why if you wanted to just like quickly take photos and spit them out, JPEG's great for that. But raw files, like it just has a really big dimension based on the camera. It's uh, based on the model of the camera. Um, but yeah, um, so for a portfolio, I would edit them in whatever this is um, in Bridge first, and then spit them out as like JPEGs, and then you put that in your portfolio, so it's much smaller. And I know that there's a problem with space, which is the disadvantage of use or yeah of using raw files. It's just really big files. It just means you may have to be more careful with like images or perspectives you choose. You're not taking like a hundred of the exact same view. Yeah, I think what I usually do is I just go out and for a hundred bucks I buy a hard drive that's a terabyte. And then um, for any of my image files or any of my big files, like if I, I keep that as a place where I download everything. Um, and then I'll go through and like select the ones that I want to keep and just trash the others. Um, so then you have a file of like your original stuff. Um, even you can get two or three or four terabytes, it's pretty inexpensive. Yes. And then when you begin working on them, then I pull them into my local drive. And so you select, then you end up selecting just a few that come into your local drive. So you have like this, I think what the thing is, is like if you, you know, you're working on a project and let's say it's end of year show and um, like that model photograph is gonna be um, 24 by 36, then you have to have like the big size, you know? Like I always try to keep large size, as large as I can of like the best photos. Um, yeah, because I think once you take your photos of your model, 
and then you wait and then you maybe like wait a year you're not going to have the same model a year later even if you try to keep it in really good condition so yeah with the buying an, a bigger hard drive external one it's a good way to just preserve your models in another form it's, a, it's how i view it it's you spend a little bit of money on the external hard drives you're not like wasting a lot of time rebuilding a whole new model to like just get that one angle in again yeah the hard drive is cheaper than the model <laughs> oh my gosh yeah 